Good afternoon again, everyone, and thank you for joining us to this, the first in our series, Stimulus, Science in Action. You know, the idea is that we are unable to have you in our labs and working with us at the, in the labs at the UWI and the Faculty of Science and Technology. And so we decided that the next best thing, and I know you all are tired of viewing PowerPoint slides on screen. And so we wanted to bring you into the lab and that's what we're gonna do. We are going to have our scientists at the UWI and our partners all over the world working in their labs, in their industries, and you are going to get a chance to interact with these scientists and see science in action. So this is the first of hopefully a three-part series for the month of August, because all of you have been so busy doing CSEC and CAPE and it took up some of the time in July, so we only have a short time and we are trying to host three of these for the month of August before you go back to school. My name is Dr. Marvardine Singh Wilmot and I'm a lecturer. I'm an inorganic chemist and I'm also the associate dean in charge of student experience here in the Faculty of Science and Technology at the UWI Mona. And the FST, you know, I will be seeing a number of you come uh, next week for orientation and some of you who are just going into sixth form in about two years time. This afternoon though, you are going to hear less from me and more from your peers because I am going to hand over to your hosts who are two students from St. Diego High School, Mr. Roberto Morgan and Miss Samoya Russell and one student from the Faculty of Science and Technology, Mr. Tyreek McLean. So I tell you a little bit about um, these guys, Mr. Roberto Morgan from St. Diego High School. I said, Roberto is a science student and he's the head boy for the upcoming academic year, 2021, 2022. Congratulations, Roberto. He plans to pursue a degree in engineering. And so hopefully he has chosen the UWI as his place to shine and the FST welcomes Roberto with open arms in another year or so. Miss Samoya Russell is a graduate of St. Diego High School. She was the valedictorian of the 2021 class. And she, so she just left fifth form and is anxiously, maybe not, maybe she's just relaxing, but she's awaiting her CSEC results. So she will be joining us here at the UWE definitely in two years time as she plans to pursue a career in medicine. So we'll be seeing Dr. Russell in another couple of years. And we have Mr. Tyreek McLean. Now Samoya and Tyreek, you will be seeing them come on screen uh, later on. They'll come up later on in the program. Mr. Tyreek McLean is the FST representative on the Guild of Students, and he is pursuing a BSc in marine biology with a minor in computer sciences. So of course, that combination of, the, of marine biology with technology is very, very important. So without any further delays, I hand you over to the capable hands of your main host, Roberta Morgan. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilmot. So good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed my pleasure to be here and to also welcome you to the first staging of this Stimulus Science in Action series. Now, this is event is put on by the Faculty of Science and Technology at the University of the West Indies Mona in association with the National, with the Natural History Museum of Jamaica. Now, as I said before, I am Roberta Morgan from the St. Guy School. I'll be your main host this afternoon, and I am very delighted to be sharing with you. Now, I'll, I'll be working with two, two other co-hosts, and I'll just ask them to identify themselves at this time. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Samaya Russell, and I, as well, am delighted in sharing this science experience with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sari McLean, and I'm very excited for this series of, uh, of seminars, and I'm looking forward to the day's activities. 
Wonderful. So again, we welcome you to this virtual event from wherever you are in Jamaica and the Caribbean or the rest of the world. I know we have high schoolers here, university students, graduates, and maybe parents and friends joining us as well. And I want you all to know that you are at the right place. For those who aren't aware, the objectives for this series is to assist primary and secondary students to foster a greater or a deeper appreciation and awareness of science. And this series will be exciting because we won't be having our standard presentations, but we will actually see both local and international scientists in action in their respective industries. And that is why, especially for those who are curious about what scientists do on a daily basis, we have you covered so you can anticipate that this afternoon. Before we proceed though, I'd just like to outline some protocols and rules that we must observe. This is an online platform and therefore to avoid the noise and disruption, we want persons to keep their mics muted at all times unless instructed otherwise. Um, feel free to turn on your cameras as well. We'd love to see those nice faces. Uh, please use the raise on feature as well. If you have a question and you will be acknowledged, you can also post your questions in the chat and we'll address them in the question and answer segment. And guys, this session is for you. It is for your benefit. So please ask your question. There is no such thing as a foolish question. And so we want to create a free space for persons to voice their concerns. And in addition to that, we'll actually have prizes for persons who are well involved. So students, please ask your questions. Now we'll introduce our presenters for this evening. And I'll just hand over now to Samoya Russell to do that at this time. Good afternoon again, everyone. Today, the scientists in action are from the Natural Products Institute at the Faculty of Science and Technology at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. The Natural Products Institute, or MPI, was established in 1999 to execute pure and applied research on Jamaican and Caribbean natural products. Now, by natural products, we're referring to our flora and fauna, or very simply, or plants and animals. We all know that in Jamaica, the use of our local plant extracts in home remedies is a strong part of our culture. Well, this has informed the science that is being done at NPI, so their mission is to unearth the full potential of natural products for the welfare of the country and region. Today, the NPI team of scientists, led by executive director, Professor Rupika Delgoda will take us into the lab and into their wonderful world of research and application where the basic chemistry, physics, and biology that we are currently learning in school comes alive in the creation of solutions for the many problems we face today. Having established that, allow me to just tell you a little about Professor Delgoda. Professor Rubika Delgoda is an award-winning scientist who did her Bachelor of, Scientist of Science in Chemistry in Papua New Guinea, a Doctor of Philosophy in Pharmacology at the University of Oxford, and a postdoctoral work in the University of Leicester in the UK before coming to Jamaica to join the Natural Products Institute at UA in 2002. She is Professor of Biochemical Pharmacology and Pharmacognosis. Professor Dagoda has been evaluating drug herb interactions, prospecting Jamaican natural products for chemicals which prevent cancer, as well as chemicals that are useful in overcoming resistance by the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes to various insecticides that are widely used in Jamaica. She has published numerous research papers, three books, 11 book chapters, and has attracted over 200 million US dollars in grant funding to the University of the West Indies. So please, help me welcome Professor Rupika Del Boda. Thank you, Samoya. 
Uh, you have made my job very easy. You have given a very nice introduction to the work that we do at the NPI. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here. It's such a great opportunity. So I thank Dr. Mavadin Singh from the Faculty of Science and Technology. I thank Tracy, Tracy McCormick from the Natural History Museum for giving me and our entire team here at the Natural Products Institute this opportunity to spend this afternoon with you. Um, so welcome to the Natural Products Institute, which is a research entity at the Faculty of Science and Technology here at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. You may be here um, because you love science and are curious about what this love could lead you to, what options there might be out there for you, or you might be at a point in life where you are seriously considering career. Whoops. Can you hear me? Yes, Professor, we can hear you. We can hear you, Prof. Did you hear any of what I had said up to that point? Yes, we were hearing you before. Okay, all of a sudden. We're very low, we Professor. And learn from you. Okay, all of a sudden it said to me that I'm muted. Can you hear me any better? Hearing you loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Okay, so as I was saying, I'm, I'm wondering why you are here today. I'm assuming that many of you are at the point in your life where you're considering what your next steps ought to be, whether your love for science could actually lead into a type, uh, a lifestyle of work that in that same uh, love, or perhaps you're just wondering what scientists in Jamaica do. You might be hearing about other scientists in the world finding out novel um, you know, solutions to our health issues, and you're wondering what scientists in Jamaica might do. Whichever, whatever the case might be for you, I hope that today you'll get a little window into the life of a research scientist here at the Mona campus. And I hope that it might inspire you to perhaps consider things for yourself and perhaps also maybe spend some time with us. And I'll speak to you a little bit about that at the end of our presentation. But firstly, before we start about anything that we do, I want to tell you that the, the laboratory that we host at the Natural Products Institute is an interdisciplinary lab, which with a focus on biomedical research. So we engage in areas of botany, chemistry, biochemistry, pharmacology, toxicology, with a, you know, with a strong foundation in mathematics, physics, statistics, and at times even engage in anthropology, sociology, and history. So depending on the project that you might be engaged in, the skills and the emphasis would, would change. Um, but I want to do, in my introduction, I want to do three things. And that is, what do we do? Uh, what are the ideas that we can I, 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 mean, I, I have two. What are the ideas that we consider? Who engages in them? Uh, and how do we go about doing that? So, first question what do we do? So, for millennia, humans have depended on nature for his medicine. Can you hear me now? Directly as is, or as technology has developed, they have extracted valuable chemicals from nature and then produced the pharmaceuticals that we go to the pharmacy to, to buy. So in fact, over the last 40 years, well mm -hmm. more than half the drugs nope. that are used nope. to treat cancer has mm -hmm. come from nature or been inspired by nature. So this business of looking into solutions from nature for drugs is still well and alive. Now, Jamaica sits in a biological hotspot where there are terrestrial, marine, and fungal resources that are found nowhere else in the world. Over a quarter of our plants are unique to Jamaica. So 
can we use those to bioprospect, look for valuable uh, activities from these plants and animals and fungi and find novel biological activity resident in them? Are we doing that? How about if you also look at our practices called ethnomedical practices? You all know that your grandmother tells you that this bush or this herb is good for this ailment. Have we studied it? Well, our own studies from the natural products tell us that 73% of Jamaicans rely on such practices. How much of this study, how much of that has undergone rigorous scientific investigations? Do we know its efficacy and the impact on the body and the safety? In fact, our studies also tell us that 80% of people who go to the pharmacy also self-medicate using herbs. Could those two types of medicines be used together safely? Can we know whether there are any interactions? In fact, you might know that your grandmothers or grandfathers you know, hypertensive medication boxes tell them don't take grapefruit juice with that. How do they know that? How do they, how have they studied that? Have we done that for our own um, herbal medicines? And so if, if so, how can we, how can we study that? Um, shouldn't we also preserve the knowledge that we have on our natural products? Shouldn't those be docu documented? So that's what we do at the Natural Products Institute. We go out to communities, we go out to various places to gather information about the types of knowledge that they have and the types of practices they have. In fact, we have books at the Natural Products Institute that has been written and conducted by our researchers here who you will shortly meet. And we have, we have these books that have been given out to the communities to, to document those. And who engages, so, so my second question was who engages in them? So I'm going to ask our team here at the Natural Products Institute to turn on their videos and do a wave, Dr. David Picking. So I'm just going to introduce the academics here, but we're going to meet the whole team shortly. Dr. David Picking, who is waving at you now, is one of the authors of this book that I showed you before. He engages quite a lot of in communities and documents the knowledge and history that we have here in Jamaica, very valuable work. And I want Dr. Sheena Francis to wave, please. And that's Dr. Sheena Francis. You're going to soon see her in the lab. Who She's really the person who's leading the, the mosquito research here in the Natural Products Institute. I also want Dr. William Irving to wave, please. There he is. He's our recent um, academics member of staff here who is engaged in molecular modeling. And again, you will see exactly what he's up to. Uh, that, those are the, the academic staff members and we have an exciting team of young scientists in the lab. And I would like you to meet them. And more importantly, I think you might want to know what, how exactly they engage in their research. Um, so I also want you to know, I mean, I'm sure you all know more than me, there are these reaction buttons at the bottom of your screens. I'd like you, I'd like this session to be as interactive as, as possible. Our host, Roberto, had, had told us that they then encourage, um, you know, comments and questions as we go along and I, I encourage you again. But at the same time, I'd like you to use these reaction buttons, buttons, put a thumbs up or put a heart or whatever you'd like to as we go along so that we get to see that you're with us and that you're engaged and whether you like it, whether you're liking what we're hearing, okay? So first of all, let me ask you all a question. Would you like to, to go and take a little tour around my lab? Please give a thumbs up if you think you'd like to join me and take a little walk around the lab. How many of you would like that? I'm now watching to see whether I'm seeing enough hands. Oh, yes. Okay, great. So then, can I ask Roberto to, to ensure that you take us around the lab, please? I'm willing, I'm gonna get up. Could we have that started now? Okay, Terry, are we gonna 
Let's go. We are ready. Let's go. We are ready. So you can always come back and check that this is the right plant that you have investigated. Sure. Okay. So tell us now, you take the plant and then you dry it and then what do you have there? You have milled it up? Sure, it's dry. So this is the fresh plant, it's dry and then it's milled into fine powdery form. So this is the powder that is then extracted in salt. Thank you, Kimberly. And what other, what other further testing as in what, what proper medicinal properties so you're going to look at? We're interested in looking at the anti-cancer properties of oh, this plant. Oh, okay. So we'll come and see how you're doing that in a little while. Okay, sure. Isaac, what are you doing over there? What is that that you have? All right, so hi everyone. I'm Isaac. I am a PhD student in the final year, uh, wrapping up. Today, I will show you the jackfruit. I've also looked at the maysberry plants. So the maysberry and jackfruit, they are plants, uh, fruits, which are really popular in Jamaica. Persons love to eat them. So what I wanted to do is to examine it, look at jackfruit, look at maysberry to see whether or not it has anti-cancer properties. Can it kill cancer? So that's one of the things that we wanted to do. So here we have a leaf, here we have fruits, and here we have the wood. So I found that the wood was actually able to kill the cancer cells and uh, but before we get to that, we have to extract it, uh, just as Kimberly described before. Have you put your voucher samples as well? So yes, we did have to bring a uh, sample of the leaf, and sometimes the, the flower would be asked for as well. So we have to bring those to the herbarium. He verifies that it is actually the plant that we're interested in, because sometimes it's not a really popular plant, and so he has to say that yes, indeed, this is the plant. So we bring to him, he verifies that it is the plant exactly here and he gives us a voucher number so that in the future we can return to it or if any of you out there wants to look at uh, jackfruit you can always go back and look at the sample that i took okay thank you so you've now given your extract to kevon hi kevon can mm. you introduce yourself and tell us what you're doing thank you okay i'm kevon stewart i'm an mphil student and an assistant at the natural growth institute so here we have sour salt leaves that have been ground up and we choose to soak them in hexane. Now in the sour salt plant you have a variety of molecules that differ in their polarity and that will affect their solubility in different solvents. So Kevon, just to tell you, sometimes people make teas out of these things, right? That right. is in water 
Right. So you can get different compounds coming out of the vortex, right? Correct? Right. Okay. But in this instance, you're using something hexane. Using hexane. Okay. So hexane, right. In the instance where you're using water to make, for example, a tea, you'll be pulling out the more water soluble compounds from the sour stuff, such as polyphenols, etc. But when you're using the hexane, you're pulling out more less water soluble compounds or more hydrophobic compounds. So if you use alcohol, you get a different type of molecules coming out, is that correct? Correct. Okay, I understand. So in that sense, we can tailor the solvent of choice according to the molecules which we're trying to extract from the plant material. Alright, so let me remove the seal. And we're going to perform a suction filtration assisted by the vacuum. So any particulate matter that would be in the solvent will be filtered out. And what you should get is a hexane solution containing the molecules in the source of the word solid in the hexane. So now that you have a crude mixture with some molecules inside them, what happens next to that? Well, either one, you now your molecules are in the filtrate, correct? Right. Okay, so you have a crude mixture with lots of molecules in the hexane. Now what happens? Alright, so with our crude mixture, we can take it into the HPLC room for further analysis to get an idea of the chemical composition of our mixture. Okay, welcome okay. back again. Thank you, Kevon. So since we have a food extract, we're going to try to see what, what compounds we have present and whether we could attempt to purify it. So Isaac, just to break it down a little bit, soursop leaf has a lot of chemicals inside them, biologically active molecules inside them, right. and Kevon has just now taken up some of those from into the hexane extract, correct? Yes. So what are you now trying to do to all those molecules that are inside? So some of them might have carried about chromatic nitrogen so this is a way to separate compounds present, but here we have a more um, advanced chromatography technique, it's called HVLC, high performance liquid chromatography. And what we'll attempt to do is to use the mobilities here, use the solvents here to separate the molecules here. Okay. Right, so we've, we're hoping to see the different compounds present as well as to collect some of these compounds. So first, we'll have to take a sample. So Isaac, while you're doing that, I'm going to keep asking you questions. Why is it important to separate these compounds out? Well, we want to make sure that the compound that we're testing, we want to make sure that whatever effect that we see, if it has anti-cancer properties or not, we can attribute it, we can say that this is a compound causing this effect in cells or otherwise. Okay. So that's the scientific method that you are following. So you have to understand the, the underlying molecule that's responsible for the bioactivity? Yes. So we come over here, we insert our sample, and uh, we're going to go now with our instrument. And so it's taking a sample from the, the 
preparation that Kevon had made, yes. and then what, where does that sample go? So this sample then goes to the HPLC, goes to the columns, where the separation takes place using the solvents on top right here. And these columns are able to chemically separate out the, the, the molecules that are in the liquid, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So these peaks that we're seeing, what do, what do they represent? What we have right here, the peaks, so each peak would represent a particular compound present in our mixture. So right here it tells us that we have at least two compounds right here. Each peak would represent one compound at okay. least. Okay, so does that allow you to now separate things out from there? Right, so we can also collect samples from here. And uh, once we collect it, we can then uh, evaporate that solvent from it and generate purified crystals, which could then be utilized in our different experiments. So we could utilize it in a cancer lab or we could utilize it with um, enzymes. For the safety part. For, okay. Right, to assess whether or not this particular compound has any effect um, in the body. Okay, so you're going to take the sample now and right. take so I'm it going to go now and distribute the samples to the cell culture room. Of the drugs that we're testing on the different cells that we're culturing. 
So as you can see, this is a yellow solution, and we just add it to our 96 well plate, just like that, and we cover it and allow it to incubate for four hours. you can see the cells changed and these are dead cells. That shows us how effective our test compounds or our natural products are. And at the end of the process, Catherine, you can tell me what happens in the 96 world plates. So the interesting thing about the 96 well plates is that the MTS actually produces a color change. And the way it works is that the cells that are still alive will metabolize the MTS and produce a dark purple color. So if you look closely, over here you see a yellow color and these are the wells that have no cells so you can imagine that this is where a situation where all the cells are dead and throughout you have different concentrations of the drugs to see in which situations are more cells dying or less cells dying and this allows us to really measure how well the drug is working so what are you working on right now well i'm working on the normal prostate cells and we're trying to see whether sour soft extract the will allow for the cancer drug to hurt the normal cells less, if that makes sense. So normally if you're doing chemotherapy, you have a very harsh reaction and you lose your hair, but we're trying to see if cell stock extract can reduce the effect on the normal cells and therefore make patients experience less harmful results. So ideally you want your natural extract to have less of an impact or more of an impact on the normal cells? We're trying to see if it can have less of an impact on the normal cells and actually more of an impact on the cancer cells. I see, I see. And are you getting great results so far? I think we are. As you can see, we have color changes happening showing that there is an effect on the cells. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. So now we need to test the drug term interactions of these compounds. Thank you for visiting our cell culture lab. Lavon, here is the analysis we have tested safely. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, I'm Lavon. I am a scientific officer here at the Natural Products Institute, and I mainly focus on work with cytochrome P450 enzymes as well as drug herb interactions. And just to explain what drug herb interactions mean, you know, in Jamaica we normally take traditional medicines, you know, like bush tea, tonics, and based on a survey that was done by the NPI, on cancer patients, we found that along with the prescribed medications that were given to the patients, we also take the herbal medicines and these can have harmful effects on our bodies. As you know, we have enzymes in our bodies and they're mainly found in the liver and the enzymes have two main functions, one of which is to convert the pharmaceutical drug that we take into another form that is able to treat the disease that we're wanting to treat and the other function is to break down the compound into another form that can be easily removed from our bodies. So, now, so I am going to be testing the plant extract on one of our enzymes okay. to see how it affects it. And so in our assay we will normally take a certain weight of this and make it up into a solvent, normally methanol or ethanol, to get a certain concentration, and then we would use that to perform our assay to see how it affects the enzymes. So uh, we have already made up the concentration here, and so we will be now pivoting some of the extract into the 96 well plate, which is what we would normally use to do the assay. How much volume is that that you're trying to measure out? Okay, so I am measuring out 30 microliters. Now this is a small volume as we don't really use large volumes for this type of assay. So we would normally pipette up and down 
just to calibrate the pipette tip so that it gets the accurate volumes. So 30 microliters, is that a millionth of a milliliter, a millionth of a liter? Yes, a millionth of a liter. So really, really small. Yes. So when we're doing the assay, we have to be very careful in dispensing the proper amount. So we would go all the way down so that all of the extract goes into the well. And then we would discard of the tip. And then after that, we would go ahead and add our enzyme substrate mix. We would normally vortex to mix everything together so that we get the correct concentration. And again, we pivot up and down to calibrate the tip. And then we will go ahead and this end. And then after we've done that, we would go ahead and incubate this in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius, as this is the optimal temperature that these enzymes work at. So this is the fluorescent spectrum spectra photometer okay. and this when you're detecting the activity of the enzyme in here yes so the enzyme would convert the substrate into a metabolite that fluorescence and the fluorescent spectra photometer would read that fluorescence so we go ahead and put this in data we can see here that the plant extract has inhibited the enzyme to some degree however I would have to go ahead and do some further analysis on this raw data to get some more information as to how much it has inhibited the enzyme hello this is dr. Sheena Francis who is in charge of the mosquito research lab at the Natural Products Institute Sheena, what do you have here Okay, so we have some Aedes aegypti, the, the mosquito that causes the dengue, chikungunya, and Zika virus. And we are studying um, plants, medicinal plants, that are able to kill the larvae. So um, this is my graduate student here, Chelsea Frank. Hello. Chelsea is from Guyana. And um, we have several uh, stages of mosquitoes here. So we have the eggs that we've collected from wild population. We have the larvae, and um, we have a few pupae, and these... Tina, can you explain to us what do you mean by larvae and pupae? Okay, so the eggs hatch. Once they hatch, they go so into... So the eggs have to be in nice, clean water like that? Mm -hmm. Well, usually Aedes aegypti like clean water. Mm -hmm. They prefer clean water as opposed to dirty water. So they tend to thrive in... Um, tanks like our potted plants and tanks that we store water in in and around our homes and, and then, then the eggs become and then when the eggs hatch they become these worm-like structures um, organisms or larvae and as they mature they go to another intermediate stage the pupae And then once they get to the pupa stage, they emerge from there into adults. What a lot of mosquitoes. Yes, there are a whole lot that we've collected from outside. I hope they're not going to come and bite anyone. Well, else. they're nicely contained, so they should not. Okay. So the reason why we test the lab, and Chelsea here is looking at um, testing larvae plant extracts on, um, on larvae, and the reason why we test the larvae is because what, Chelsea? So we test the larvae because usually in the rural communities, we have persons who might store water that they catch from the rain for whatever purpose that they want to use it for at home. But this can also be breeding grounds for mosquito larvae. So we try to test them on the larvae so that we can see if it kills the larvae. That would prevent it from moving on to the adult stage, which is the most problematic stage. So we just want to cut it before it gets too advanced and becomes a greater problem. So here, 
We've already extracted our plant sample and I am just taking small sample, small amounts of the sample and I just add it to a container containing some larvae and we observe it for a 24 hour period just to determine if it will kill the larvae or not. So you are trying to develop natural products that can kill a, a diseased mosquito, is that correct? Yes. Okay, yes. So typically, at the natural products institute, of course, we focus only on natural products. So once we found one plant that works very well within in one area, we try to just establish the range of the plant. So we'll test it to see ant plant properties, we might test it to see larvicidal properties, just to see just the range of the plant so we have like a full understanding of what the plant is capable of doing. I think so what we found from previous research is that the mosquitoes are resistant to what is popularly used in fogging and what is popularly used in sprays around the house. And so since they're resistant, you know the efficacy of those is very slim. So we just try to find what is an alternative to the insecticide. So you're trying to, to do two things here. Right, so we're trying to test it for insecticide resistance, well, for insecticidal properties, I'm sorry, but then we're also trying to see if there's a way to overcome the resistance that we, have, we already established that is. Okay, thank you very much. Good day, Dr. Irvin. Here's our active ingredient, DTS. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Dr. Irvin. I'm a molecular modeler or a structural biomedician. So my job is to look at molecules on a computer in a resolution that's not accessible in the lab. So, for example, this DTS compound that I just received, this is what it looks like in terms of its structure. I can take this structure and put it in a computational format and see what it looks like on a computer. Once I have this compound on the computer, I can look at its interactions with proteins to see how they would interact to prevent disease or to cure certain aspects. So this is what the protein would look like um, in its three-dimensional form, something that you wouldn't be able to see in a lab. And then based on its interactions, I can generate a profile of their binding mode, which I can use to drive further drug discovery efforts. So Dr. Irving, why is it so important that we understand it at such a small molecular level? Right, so in terms of diseases or things that go wrong in the human body, they almost always involve a protein. And proteins are made of amino acids, hundreds of them, thousands of them sometimes, and just one change in an amino acid can drive a malfunction of the protein and therefore a disease. So if you are able to understand the active site in the protein or the residues or the amino acids that are important for its function, then seeing it on such a resolution can give you a detailed insight into how not only the protein works, but how the drug interacts with the protein. Okay. So the, the, uh, the molecule that was brought across, which is a natural molecule, yes. now you are trying to understand how that molecule binds to some of the important enzymes in the body, is that yes. right? Yes. Okay. So almost all the uh, compounds or things you ingest are uh, metabolized by the same class of enzymes in the human body. So a first step in drug design or in understanding how compounds interact in the human body is to see how they interact with that family of enzymes. 
So what computers allow us to do is to get atomic level insight into these molecules and their interactions, which is a resolution that would otherwise not be able to be achieved in the lab. In this way, we can work hand in hand with experimentalists or people in the lab to not only validate their results, but provide more information about them and maybe drive new hypotheses. And this is a very powerful tool and a cost effective one, as it can all be done from the comfort of a desk and chair. So practically, I'm most interested in proteins because any malfunction of them is what usually underlies the cause of a disease. Uh, so whenever you think of a disease, you also want to think of a cure. Uh, these cures can be either natural or synthetic. And what's important in them is when you administer them for a therapeutic effect is their interaction with the protein. And computers allow us to view those interactions on a more detailed level than you would otherwise be able to achieve in a lab. So from high school, for high school students interested in a career like yours, what are some things that they need to be paying attention to in school and following a path? What, what, what is the career path that you follow? What types of subjects should you be thinking about from right. high school going into university? So I did the sciences at O level or CXC or is that what it's called now? Um, as well as A-level. Uh, so biology and chemistry are the most important. Math is always good to have. In terms of more detail than that, organic chemistry is the big one and biology and understanding how the different systems in the body work. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Wow, excellent presentation there from the team at NPI. I can say I learned a, a lot, many things I never knew before. And, it, and it's so amazing to see the machinery they use at the labs. Wow. Um, we want to stay on time. Um, it's currently 3.58. Uh, we're going straight into the question and answer segment. And those questions will be directed to Professor Rupika Delgoda. All right, so guys, you can, persons who want to ask your question, just raise your hands and you'll be identified. And before we start, I'm going to ask everybody at NPI to turn on their their video so everyone can see so we'd be have answers would be answered by everyone here appropriately and um, i'd also encourage people who want to ask questions to turn on their cameras too so we can see you go ahead roberto okay so i'm looking for the hands uh persons who want to ask your question and just raise your hands, or you can also post them in the chat as well. You can have them answer. Okay, I see a hand there by Cecile, Rachel Cecile. You can open a camera and go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you. Yes, uh, I enjoyed the presentation, very wonderful presentation. Unfortunately, I can't put on my camera right now because my house is very dark. Uh, my question, I was very interested in the uh, mosquito insecticide. I believe it was made from soursop extract. Well, is that? Yes, it was. Yeah, great. So I'm assuming it smells like soursop? <laughs> um, okay, so the... The extract doesn't normally smell like the plant, uh -huh. so uh, so no, it doesn't. It, it oh. doesn't necessarily smell like sour stuff. After it's extracted, it doesn't necessarily smell like the plant itself. Okay, <laughs> I was wondering if it does. Like, what would you do in terms of like children? You know, sour stuff is a nice smell. So like, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Okay, that's it from Cecile. Roberto, um, 
um, in the chat, they were quite interested in the high performance liquid chromatograph that advanced chromatography machine, as opposed to the simple paper chromatograph lab that we would do in fourth form. So I think they would want an in-depth uh, explanation of how it would work and how the different extracts are used to get the final results for testing. All right, so, all right, so it works by, the separation happens by using a column. Column is a cylindrical um, cube that's placed inside the HPLC. So what happens is that the needle takes up the sample and it is carried along through the whole system by solvents that were shown on top of the HPLC. So those solvents are mixed together depending on the polarity of the solvents, the compounds also are also soluble to different degrees. So once the solvent, once the mobile phase, as we call it, passes through the column, it carries different components, different um, compounds in the sample to varying degree, at uh, varying speeds. So the compounds are separated. First one comes off, the second one comes off, the third one comes off based on the polarity of the mobile phase, how they are mixed together. So instead of using a paper and, uh, and the solvent in the lab, the column represents a paper and it's subdivided into many, many parts so that the separation is efficient. Thank you. Um, well, I heard something about spinning, would that be saying 50? Centrifugation. Would any of that be involved? In terms of the separation? Yes, in the chromatograph. No, not, no, no, it wouldn't. They also asked if it used a lot of energy because it seemed quite big. Uh, I'm not sure about you, the amount of energy it uses, but it is quite intensive. There are about four or five different components that make up that instrument that you see there. So there's a component uh, to, to, to sample, to take a sample from your plant. There's another component to separate. There's a component to pump or push, push, the, the, sample, push the solvent through the system. And then there's another component, which I didn't mention before, that would actually detect when the compound um, is passes through. So there are, many there are many different parts of this instrument. As oh, well as it's a computer, so. Thank you. Um, okay. Even just machines like that, where would one source that type of machinery and who would make it? That's an awesome question. <laughs> the instrument itself is very, very, very expensive. So you could see instruments like these costing hundreds of thousands of US dollars, at many millions in Jamaican currency. So it's not something you can go shopping at Mega Mart for, <laughs> or you can easily obtain. It's pretty um, geared towards scientific use. It's, it's pretty expensive. And there is the whole research at UE funds this. Um, Dr. Delgoda. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was that question? I didn't hear the question. I was asking about the funding geared towards the machinery. Right. So as, as you gathered, it's an efficient method of separating chemicals. And as they get separated because of the detection systems that it has, um, these detective systems could have could be varied, could be light UV detectors, it could be fluorescent detectors. So multiple mm -hmm. types of detects are attached to it, and it's just a much more powerful method of separating than the, the paper chromatography that would be used in your labs. Um, so that's why it's expensive. It's also highly um, technical to maintain it. Um, service provisions for this type of laboratories are very limited here in, in Jamaica. Um, we actually have one in, in Trinidad that services all our instruments here. 
and where does our money come from? Um, I mean, this is what research scientists do. So I, I might have mentioned at the very beginning that this is a dedicated research institute in that uh, majority of our time mm -hmm. by the academics are spent in, in doing research. So we write grants and attract grants from overseas and local sources. Um, so a lot of our times are spent in writing grant proposals, convincing those who read those grant proposals that what we do is important. Um, so, I mean, in other countries like the US, the UK, there are institutes that are dedicated to funding research like this. Jamaica's economy, as you know, has many, many other demands. Um, and so our, you know, our, our purse is much smaller for scientific research. So as scientists, we write grant proposals that go to international agencies. There are some local um, places that can we can go to like the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica and so on. Um, and we write proposals to them on a, on a you know, on a, so almost on a monthly basis, we write proposals and we try to attract grants that help us keep us going and be able to answer the questions that we want to answer. Um, but that's a challenge. That's one of the challenges of uh, being a research scientist anywhere in the world, but well, particularly acute for us because of the fact that we don't have huge foundations that will fund um, high, high level um, research, scientific research. I mean, what we want to also do is to encourage private sector in the country to get involved in um, helping us answer these questions. But that's a that's a you know a topic for another this another place maybe. But um, we write for grants, try and attract these grants, and try and then maintain this this uh, instrumentation. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you very much for the information. This goes ahead to Roberto. Yes. I mean, I can say that the industry must attract a lot of funds because based on the introduction I made earlier, um, I think someone you mentioned that you would have attracted over 2 million US dollars in funding for the university. So science is very expensive and I can really see that. We have a number of hands up. I think I saw Michaela Miles, we can, Go ahead, open your mic and your camera if you can. Okay, good afternoon. I'm not sure if this question was asked already, but what undergraduate degrees will, should one pursue if they're interested in this line of work, such as at the Natural Product Institute? Um, thank you, Michaela. As I mentioned, we are an interdisciplinary laboratory with a focus on biomedical research. Um, and depending on the area of your interest, um, your, your sort of focus needs to change. I would say in general, science graduates or, or scientists who want to get a scientific, um, you know, F FS, Faculty of Science and Technology driven chemistry, biology, biochemistry, biotechnology, um, those are the areas that we get our graduate students from. So I would, if you are a high school student, encourage you to continue chemistry, encourage you to keep your maths going because math is very important. Um, I would encourage you to have biology if you can, um, but being very strong in your maths, chemistry, physics, uh, biology is, is Fundamental. These are fundamental things. And as you as you get interested in different fields, you can begin to specialize in. In, in I mean, we we have statistics, as I said. We have even you know there's an interest to work with people. Dr. Picking, who is here, can speak a little bit about his own research, which means going out to the field and getting involved in community work, and that requires a different set of skills too. Um, but definitely, core sciences are very very important to continue. Okay, thank you. That's it from Miss Miles. Okay. We have Chanel Bernard. You can go, go ahead. Okay, so I wanted to know if your lab specializes in using the whole fruit or the leaf um, by itself instead of taking the extracts out. 
So I know here in Antigua, um, well, what I've heard that the medical community, they don't really accept um, naturopathic doctors with open arms because they argue that you can't quantify how much of the guava leaf, for example, you need to take to um, ease your discomfort if you have bowel dis discomfort. So I wanted to know if your lab looks into, or researches rather, um, using the fruit or the leaf instead of just extracting the components. Yes, we do, but I'm going to invite Dr. Picking to answer this question. I'm sorry to hear that naturopaths aren't uh, welcome with open arms, but because um, I trained as a naturopath originally. Um, I think, I mean, the challenge is natural products as been indicated are made up of many, many different types of molecules. Um, so I think most people, if they're thinking about modern medicine, they think about pharmaceutical drugs, which tend to be single entities. And often so a single molecule and often those single molecules actually in 40% in some countries or some regions are still derived from plants. Um, so on the one hand, you have pharmaceuticals, which are easy to think about in terms of pharmacy and dose. But on the other hand, you have plant-based medicines where perhaps doctors get very nervous because they don't necessarily know what the levels of those molecules are in the plants. And that's where the science and the tradition actually come together very powerfully. So to answer your question specifically, the type of research that we can do so if you took that plant-based medicine, you might be able to identify what is in the plant that is active and gives it its clinical effect. And then in the plant, you can measure the proportion of that key phytochemical. And that's what we call standardization. So in your plant-based medicine, you can actually buy it off the shelf and know that there's 4% of that particular phytochemical in your whole plant, which will make it efficacious and effective for the condition that you want to treat. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much for your answer. You're very welcome. All right. Um, we have, I saw Kmart Buchanan. I think you had your hand raised. Kmart Buchanan. All right, I'm not hearing you. Um, we can go on to Mr. Williams, Jody Williams. We can have a question now. Thank you very much. Um, I must say that the presentation was very informative. I have learned a lot. My question, when I saw the machine, uh, we are always taught in school that the paper chrom chromatography separates like colors but could I ask, like, in a practical, in a practical sense, like, like, since a lot of money was spent on the machine, what is like the, pra the, the practicability of the machine? What is it like used for instead of just separating colors? Like, is it used for forensics to separate? I would like to have some insight on what it was in a practical sense. An instrument with great versatility. Um, the basics of it, of chemistry of it, is that it, it separates things out. So it separates, separates mixtures based on their chemistry. And so wherever you get a mixture, you and you're interested in understanding the components, so their, um, you know, to the concentrations of each component in them, or for example, how much it, of each one is present in them, uh, or if you're interested in isolating one or two of them from the mix to separating them out, then this instrument becomes handy. So where do you see them? Yes, forensic labs would have them. Um, you have them in, for example, in, in the ganja industry where you want to be able to say, okay, here's my plant or my plant, uh, material, how much of this does, does this have on the uh, 
different variety of plant produces different amounts of THC. How do we know that? Well, you, you take a plant and you take a, 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 an extract of it and you then able, you should be able to quantify the amount of THC in each of those species that you might be growing under different conditions or in different fields, for example, then you need to be able to quantify one or two of those ingredients present in that mixture. So wherever there's an industry that is based on quantification of something that exists in a mixture, then this is a very versatile instrument to have. Um, coffee industry might have it in a different form. So this is an HPLT, which is based on liquid, but you can also have the mobile face being, instead of being a, a solution, you can have the mobile face being a gas, where the gas is the one that's carrying through, separating out things that are in a mixture. So you can have it in the coffee industry, you can have it in... Um, you know anything that is trying to quantify amounts and trying to think about the things there are new new fields that are coming up in trying to identify well in, in any most pharmaceutical companies we don't have any in jamaica where we're actually developing drugs as like a, for pharmaceutical purposes but like dr dr um picking said if you prepare anything, even if it is a tea and you're trying to use it for a medical purpose, you need to be able to say this amount of this particular active ingredient is present in that, which means you have to quantify, which means you have to separate them out from whatever the mixture holds. And if that's the case, HPLC is many times the method that you might fall back into. So industrial applications are vast and you know, I can't even start to name all. Um, but research laboratories also, to also tend to have them just because it serves a huge purpose. Thank you. Um, I, could I ask some more questions, please? In the presentation where the mosquito was carried to the gentleman and he had a computer that showed a 3D version of the of molecules, I was very fascinated because it brought me back to when I did what I'm currently doing. Um, TD, which is AutoCAD, which shows like it can give a 3D view. Is it like a special computer or is it a special software that shows the, the molecules in the lattice format? Or is it like it's a normal computer with just an application? Because it is a very interesting format when you can see the molecules um, out into that structure. It's it is a normal computer in a sense. It is a powerful computer, but it uses specific software, a range of software to either visualize the molecule in its static or in the state that I showed you, or you can use it to visualize a trajectory of how it behaves over time, which uses a different software. If you're looking at interactions between the molecules, that's again a different software, but all of it is done through a desktop computer or a laptop. Or in terms of large scale operations, you would need a high performance computing cluster, which is a series of cores um, that are accumulated to give you the most computing power possible. But um, all these computation things are limited by the software and the rules that govern them in terms of the force fields and the theoretical physics and chemistry behind the interactions. And they're also governed by the computing processing power that you have. So, as we get more and more powerful computers, we can achieve more and more in terms of time scale and in terms of potential. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, Someone, you could you just look in the chat to see questions as well? I think there are some, but I can't really. Sure. Okay, Roberta, I think you have two more people who have questions and you're going to have to, I know, I know there are lots of people who want to talk, but in the interest of time, we're going to have to start to wind down. So maybe take the last two hands. What's going on in the chat is nice because the team from NPI keep answering the questions that are in the chat. So I think go for the last two hands and then we can begin to close. We have exciting things to talk about for next week and we have two prizes to give away. Okay, great. Um, so the last two hands, I'm seeing Desmond Campbell. You can open your mic quickly and ask a question. Campbell, Good afternoon, fellow scientists. Yes, are you, are you hearing me? 
Yes, we're hearing you. Okay, so I enjoy the presentation. I always enjoy science. I'm a science educator for some 34 years from early childhood all the way to university level. And I have enjoyed the naturopathic pathway, nutraceuticals, uh, that, that has always been my love. I have seen the sustainability of it. It may not be quick, but it's certainly sustainable. And um, my question, I, I am so happy to see different machines at work. A uh, couple of years ago, when I first saw an uh, electrophoresis machine at work, I, I was appalled having learned about this from A-level days coming up, but actually seeing one at work. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to know that other machines of similar import have been impressed into the science field. Now, what I would like us to work at uh, is not just the extraction of these compounds, and perhaps to see the, 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 the quantities of each compounds there. But on the more application side, I have noticed that if, although it is very effective, but naturopath, naturopathic medicine is not that recognized, nor is it taken on by the insurance companies so as to be uh, acknowledged as a, a way of life, or even though it is more effective, as I, I may tell you. I may not be able to relate the stories to you in this short time now, but I've seen it at work. Um, what are we doing in terms of moving towards the ethics commit committee, the ethics commission? I want to hear something on this because I can tell you, doubling up on my educational cap, I also represent the Association of Science Teachers of Jamaica, and I also represent science education and the National Commission on Science and Technology. So I'm interested in that response. Um, I'm trying to understand your question properly, Mr. Campbell. Is it that you're asking what, how we're moving forward in terms of the ethics of approving natural or nutraceuticals towards a more broader use and a, or an acceptable use? Is that your question? That's a part of it. Yes, you can address that directly. Thanks. Right. Okay. Um, I. I, mean, I don't know how much you, you've heard, maybe it's not in the popular media yet, but there is a very positive move towards accepting natural health-based products um, called NHPs, natural health products, um, by the government where they have approved for the Food and Drug Act to be amended to insert something in between food and drug. So currently, if there is a product that's used, it either falls into the food category or a drug category. There's nothing in between. And I think what you are interested in, nutraceuticals, would fall into that in-between category called natural health products. So over the last three years or so, the, na the national nutraceutical industry has been very busy going through and getting all the stakeholders involved and going through the amendment of the Food and Drug Act to incorporate something called the natural health products. And the regulations around it has also been sort of, you know, um, gone through well, they're going through it to make sure that this is correctly done. Um, and so I think that's the first move to try and get nature-based medicines which would have completely different regulations to getting them authorized to, to a com different compared to a drug. So, so I, I, I mean, I'm happy to report that and hopefully we will see that coming through the legislature and the approval through the parliament very, very soon. Okay, Prof Del Delgoda I'm, and Roberto, I'm gonna jump in here in the interest of time and um, and ask it, Nikki. Nikki has her hand up. And Nikki, if you're a student, we're gonna take your question. If you're not a student, we're gonna ask you to type that question in the chat. And as we do the wrap up, we can give you a text. Nikki, tell us about you. Hello, good afternoon. This is just, yes, I'm a student. Um, it's just a really simple question. Um, can you use any type of can you use any type of plant or fruit tree um, to 
use extract to make uh, medicines and things like that? Do you want to take this one? Uh, David, you can. Sure. Um, William, you can too. Sorry. So if I start, so the, a lot of the work that we do at Natural Products Institute is actually to go into communities um, because as, as Prof said earlier, 73% of Jamaicans are using medicinal plants day in, day out. So um, what that gives us when we go out into communities and we meet with communities and we document that traditional use, um, it helps us and everybody else to identify, you know, which plants are most commonly used and which ones are consistently used. And that is really, really important, not just to document that traditional knowledge so that everybody is still able to access and it, that knowledge doesn't die out um, because often it's an oral tradition in, across the Caribbean. But it also helps us from a scientific point of view to identify those plants that are likely to give us both plant-based medicines and, and potentially longer term pharmaceutical drugs as well. So our focus is on supporting community use. So the greater use of plants at a community level through documenting that knowledge, the development of potential nutraceuticals, plant-based extracts, um, and then longer term, the also the potential for the development of pharmaceutical drugs. And that all comes from that traditional knowledge. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. We have a lot more questions in the chat, but we not, will not be able to answer them. So persons with their questions, you can also email uh, Professor Delgado and her team and you can get your answers there. So that would conclude our question and answer segment. And Roberto. We, we want to give away the yes, prizes. Doctor. I'm going to put the team from NPI on the spot here. I think what we should do, uh, Prof, is to come up with two questions and ask the team to help me to watch the chat. And the first, so let's do one at a time. And the first person to type the correct answer, Prof, uh, we could say, because we, we thought that, you know, we would give it to the persons who engage, but we had so much engagement and we don't have so many prizes. <laughs> we have Tracy come up from the Natural History Museum waiting to give away something. So, uh, Prof, you think we could manage that? We have two. You mean you'd ask, you'd want us to ask a question and see who can answer it first? Yes, as you know, something related to things that have been said in your presentation, um, simple things that we know um, many people will get and it comes down to the speed and not to the fact that they don't know. And they'll type the answer in the chat and the first answer to come in, we'll, we'll award that and then we go for round two. What do you guys say? Sure. I'm Roberto, back. are you okay with that? Yes, yes, let's go. Okay, I will ask a quick question and then I want my team, they took almost together. So they have some time to think about one quickly and I'll ask my team to come up with a question too. Um, but my first question is, what percentage of Jamaicans engage in self-medication with, with herbal medicines? <laughs> we have a fast type of... Um, okay, so Rachel answered it first. Wow. How did and she do that? that? Oh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, one uh, one question there. Um, team, do you have a question? Another one. William, do you have one? David, do you have one? I put two in the group chat. I'm waiting for confirmation. I will ask ask it here verbally. One is much harder than the other. Go for the easier one, William. Uh, <laughs> what does HPLC stand for? All right. Working. Oh, gosh. Oh, yes. got it again. Rachel got it again. Oh, no, what no. do we do? Oh, OK, we're minute. going to have to take Rachel out of the game. <laughs> Yes, let's, 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 let's,
Show me. Is... From Mary Grant, Garnet. Garnet. Tamir is from Guyana. Wonderful. Okay. Okay, great. So do your prizes, um, Roberto, and I'm going to ask Sh both Shamir and Rachel to just send me a private message with some contact information while Roberto explains and ha I have Tracy come over and talk about the prizes. All right, so we will have uh, Miss Tracy come out as she's the director of the Natural History Museum to just show us the prizes she has for us and just to tell, tell us a little, about, little bit about the organization. Okay, so, so good afternoon. Miss, thank you, yeah. thank you, I'm here. And just to say thank you to both Professor Delgado, Del, 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 De, sorry, Delgoda, <laughs> sorry, Rupika. I always yes, call you Rupika, that's why I'm saying, saying this. And also to Marvadeen, thank you so much for inviting us to participate. This is something that we really like to do. So before I show the prizes, just tell you a little bit about the Natural History Museum of Jamaica. We fall under the Institute of Jamaica, and the Institute of Jamaica is an agency of the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport. Um, natural history has been around since the time of the Institute, 1879. And our main function is to help institutions like Rupikas to kind of know more about our plants and our animals, especially the ones that are only found in Jamaica. So I really have to give a big, big up to NPI and the team for the research that they're doing. So we have collections here, nat um, national collections of both plants and animals that you will find nowhere else in the world. And people sometimes use these collections, especially researchers for references, or even the general public will come in wanting to know more about our plants and animals. And even you as students and the general and, and teachers and, and just interested individuals can come in and look at our collections. Well, not everybody will have access, direct access, but you can have access, some amount of access to the collection to see what we have already collected. Some of them may be extinct in the field now. Some of them may be threatened by um, activities, our own human activities. So that's some of the work that we do at the Institute of Jamaica. We also have researchers who go out in the field. We also have a science library. We have an online, um, what's it called, a biodiversity network. So you can find more information about our plants and animals. Um, so today the prizes, um, we have an IOJ branded cup, right? That's one of the prizes that we'll be giving away today. Um, it's important that once the research is being done, that we document the research. And so we have what's called a Jamaica Journal. I think you've seen it in the reverse, right? But this is one of the publications out of the Institute of Jamaica where we, we document information, not only on plants and animals, but other things happening in, in society. And then we're in the time of COVID. So we also have an IOJ branded mask. So those are some of the things that we have right now to give away. So thank you for, especially to the winners today. And thank you MPI for a very interesting presentation. I've had the opportunity to visit, but it was an eye opening again to see it step-by-step step and, on, and online. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kamak. Um, so our winners again were Rachel Cecile and uh, that is Shamir Garnet. So I'll just kind of ask you guys just to send Miss Mrs. Kamak your contact information so she can organize you picking up your token and so on. And again, we can also ask you guys just to open your mics. That is Rachel Cecile and Shamir. Just open your mics and tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what you plan to pursue um, in the future. Rachel, you can go first. Rachel? <laughs> uh, thanks, Shamir. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel, and I am from Guyana. I am a student at the University of Guyana. I'm currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in food science. Oh, you want to do a master's? Yeah, thank Excellent. you. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I must say I love the presentation today. Well done. Uh, my name is Shamar Garnett. You've really been pronouncing it correctly. And I'm also a, from Guyana, and I'm a University of Guyana student and pursuing a bachelor's degree 
in chemistry. So I'm looking forward to a career in chemistry. Okay, great and well done from our winners today. Um, I'll now hand over to Terry McLean and he'll close us out. All right, good evening again, everyone. So I will close us, close us off with the vote of thanks. First, we must thank Professor Delgoda and the entire team at the National Products Institute. Uh, it was an enlightening, for giving us that enlightening uh, presentation about the nature and the importance of Jamaica in the field of biology done by the Natural Products Institute. In addition to, the, to giving us a, a look into what you actually do and how it relates to what we're doing now in high school and at the university level. Next, we thank the person who conceived and organized this event, and that is no other than Dr. Marvadeen Singh Wilman, Wilmot, who is the Associate Dean for the Student Science Experience in the Faculty of Science and Technology, who has remained mostly off screen for today to put us, and us as in the students, uh, in the spotlight. Next, well, we would like we would also like to thank the entire team from the FST office, especially Ms. Terian Collins Free and Omar Owens for, for their organizational and technical support. The National the Natural History Museum for partnering with the FST to make this series possible and for the prizes they offer. We would also like to thank all who helped to publicize and finally. We would also like to thank all those who helped to publicize this event. And finally, we would like to thank you all for joining us today and participating. Remember, you know, join us next week as we will engage as our, remember to join us next week when we will see scientists at the Canadian Light Source, which has a synchron particle accelerator. Yes, just like the one in the flash. There will be scientists in action in next week's edition of Stimulus. So look out for the flyer or visit the FST website and subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep abreast of all that is going on. Uh, the links should be posted in the chat. Uh, the links will be posted in the chat. So just keep up to date with all of that. UWE is your place to shine and the FST is your go-to place for science, knowledge, research, and solution. Uh, just a quick sum up of what the University of West Indies FSD program offers. We have over 2,748 students and in the other undergraduate program and 282 at the graduate level registered for our master's, MPhil, and PhD program. Uh, there, the ranges of the fields that you can get your major in are wide and they vary. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your day. And please to be sure to fill out that student, that survey in the chat. Uh, let me repost it. So please to give us your feedback using the survey posted in the chat. Uh, thank you. Navadin, before you leave, can I add something here quickly? Yes, please go go ahead, Prof. Okay, I just want to tell you all that, as you may have seen, our lab has PhD students, we have MPhil students, we have an undergraduate student, you saw Catherine Chen talk about her experience here. And we've also in the past had um, high school students, one or two high school students have joined us. We want to be able to expand this capacity and be able to invite, continue to invite high school students. Um, so this COVID time does not allow us to do that right now, but I want you to keep your ears and eyes open as we you know, hopefully expand our capacity. What we'd like to do is to encourage early starts into research careers, and we would be happy to host one or two um, students that qualify that will be able to spend some time in the lab going, going forward. And I hope there will be other departments here at the faculty that might be able to encourage students to do the same. So all the best. Thank you, Prof. Yeah,
That is wonderful. Thank you so much. I hope everyone heard that. <laughs> Someone is at 30. <laughs> Well, you have some things to look no, forward no, to. Nikki. Nick, um, Nikki Ann, I, we actually do have a camp. So look out for flyers on the camp. All right. We have a 13 to 16 year old camp. I said I put the email in the um, in the chat. So go ahead and email us so we know um, to send our flyer to you. Great, great. Thanks again to the entire team and thank you all. We're going to fix what's going on with the with the link with the survey. So just give us give us some time and we'll get that to you. I we're we're doing so many things here at the same time, but that one will be will be um, will be fixed and we'll get that form to you for your um, for your feedback. So thanks again to the NPI team. It was wonderful and thank you all. I know some of you, some we now have a 12 year old. I know there are some, some preschoolers possibly here watching and that's fine, that's fine. That's what we want. So we look forward to hearing from all of you and seeing you again next week when we go to the particle accelerator. And I see people talking about that matter already. Um, yes, you will be there on the synchrotron. Um, where we're doing lots of fantastic science, including some of the things, looking at some of our, our natural products and, um, and lots of other things in material science. Um, you name it, you come back next week, look out for the, for the flyer, you will have to register again. It was wonderful having you all. We had up to, I think, 95 or so people. Um, and I see people are advertising. It was a great session. <laughs> Let's give us a round of applause, NPI. Wonderful. Great Thank initiative. You Lots of for the opportunity. It's just, it's just wonderful to watch all the comments coming in. Okay, so the, so the updated link for the survey, the survey has been fixed. We're going to have to get those prizes over to Guyana. <laughs> it was great. Amazing. That's Nadisha. Nadisha, nice that you came. So some of our UE students, high schoolers, preschoolers, um, NPI, we did mission accomplished. Exciting young people about, about science. Hi, Nadisha. Thank you, Nicole. And thanks, everybody, as you walk out of the room. Finally, thanks to the hosts, to Roberto, to Samoya, and to Tyreek. Let's give them a round of applause, too. Thank you for having us today. You guys did a great job. I did say preschoolers. Thank you. What a pleasure being here. Samoya, you did a great job. Where's where is oh Tariq is still there? Roberto, congratulations. St. Jago's flag was flying high. Thank you. It was a my delight being here as well. Learned a lot from the NPI team. Wonderful. I'm sure some of your teachers were there watching you. Mm-hmm. Look forward to having you here on the campus. I have Miss Nicole Kerwaka, my chemistry teacher. Oh, Nicole is your chem teacher. Nice. Nicole, yes. Miss Nicole is also my chem teacher. Or was she my was chemistry here. teacher? She was here. She was here in the audience. Okay, who are the Ravens? I was proud of the Ravens. Are you guys Ravens? Yeah, we are Ravens. Oh, the St. Jago people are called Ravens. Please forgive my ignorance on these matters, okay? No problem, no problem. St. Jago Ravens. Yay, Nicole, your students, your students are excellent. They'll become our students in a little time, so in a short time. All right, team, so we will talk 
on WhatsApp, Roberto and Samoya and Tariq. And thanks again, Prof. Delgoda. And the entire team from NPI. I am going to sign off now.